Okay, so at this point, we have established that language is really about sound, uh, that the different writing systems that we might have, uh, you know, whether we use an alphabet, a futhork, uh, a syllabary writing system, a hieroglyph writing system, an ideographic, uh, 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 an ideologic writing system, none of those really matter in terms of the sound itself. You can represent a language in any, almost any particular alphabet. Um, so, uh, what about English itself? Well, before we get into the case of English itself, we still have to put it in this sort of broader idea of language uh, and the backgrounds of different languages and the backgrounds of English. And so, one thing that we're really looking at right now is Indo-European, or P-I-E, Proto-Indo-European, which is a language family. So, uh, in the 18th century, uh, one happy accident from the, of the British Empire was that you had these uh, speakers, uh, these highly educated speakers of English who had studied Greek and Latin in school, and then they're in India where they're, they're learning other languages, and they're starting to see some interesting similarities uh, among those languages. And from that, we begin to get this idea that maybe those, these languages are related to one another. Now, because sound change is regular, this enables us to trace that language family back, to find from particular sound changes, to find the ways in which these different languages are interrelated with one another. And so this is the Indo-European uh, language family. Now, there are other language families. Indo-European happens to be the one, uh, for reasons we don't have to get into, that we can trace back uh, the farthest. So we, you know, we do have other languages, many other languages in the world, that don't fit into the Indo-European uh, language family. Are the Indo-European languages related to those languages? Maybe, probably, but we don't know for sure. Um, was there only one original language, one that's sometimes called Proto-World? Well, a lot of people think that there probably was, but we can't prove it yet. Uh, and we also can't prove that there were multiple ones. So it's really hard to say, but we do know uh, uh, for sure about this language, uh, Proto-Indo-European. And when you look at this language tree that you'll see in your workbook, in your textbook, you'll see a wide variety of languages. And in some ways, it's kind of shocking to think of how many of these different languages that you don't think are being in any way closely related to one another are, in fact, quite closely related to one another. Uh, and so when you look at this, the Proto-Indo-European language family, you see that it's divided into other kinds of subfamilies. You've got Germanic. Uh, you've got the, the Celtic language, the Italic, or sometimes the Romance languages, and sometimes called the Hellenic, you know, uh, uh, the Indo-Iranian, uh, the Balto-Slavic languages. So we have all these different language families. And when you look at the tree, you might be able to see how it was that these various different languages that were very similar, uh, the, the similarities in these various different languages allowed us to trace this tree uh, back because you've got uh, these uh, British uh, speakers and then later uh, Germanic, I'm uh, sorry, German uh, 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 proto-linguists, really linguists, uh, who are, um, come from the Germanic language family as their, as their language family. They've studied Greek, which is one of the Hellenic or, uh, uh, languages, uh, and Latin, which is a, a Romance or Italic language. Uh, so that's three branches of them. And then they're off in India, where they're learning things like Sanskrit and Hindi, uh, uh, Hindi Bengali, you know. Uh, and so there are these four different languages that a lot of them had some knowledge of, or at least language families a lot of them had some knowledge of, and they started to see these similarities. Uh, so when you look at this, it's important then, uh, the, the you're going to have to learn this tree for the exams. Uh, it's important to note, too, what you're looking at. So, for example, sometimes students will look at this tree and they'll misunderstand what they're looking at. And so sometimes I'll hear a student say, well, English comes from German. English does not come from German, and German does not come from English. They both have a common ancestor, that common ancestor uh, being Germanic. So essentially what happened is you had these Germanic speakers, and then 
Uh, as we've talked about before, those languages sort of drifted apart in different directions. And what you would think of as modern German and what you think of as uh, 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 English come from those as well as the other uh, languages. So when you're studying the tree, and I do want you to learn the tree, uh, you need to pay special attention to the Germanic language family. Also, it's important, I think, that you note uh, uh, under the Celtic language family, we have these Britonic languages like Welsh, Cornish, and Breton. Th those are going to be uh, somewhat important when you get to the next uh, chapter. Um, and also uh, note that uh, under the Italic languages, Latin, where you have French and Norman French, that those Romance Italic languages are are uh, important to the development of English also. Uh, less so like, say, for example, the Balto Slavic languages, the Indo Iranian languages, those are much less important to the particular development of English. You are going to have to know how those fit into the tree. Uh, and sometimes students say, well, does it matter moving left to right? Uh, no, uh, uh, none of that matters. Uh, you could depict this tree instead as a web spreading out or any number of other, other ways. Now, aside from that, I also want you to learn the uh, uh, what's called Grimm's Law, or sometimes called the first sound shift. Uh, and this is a movement for, uh, of sounds from Indo-European to Germanic. And um, I would also want to note that in some editions of the workbook, uh, the fourth step is misprinted, so be sure you are learning the version in the textbook. And if you see uh, a difference between the workbook and the textbook, uh, you know, pay attention to to the, the textbook itself. Um, and so steps one, two, and then uh, and then four and five move us from the sounds in Indo-European to the sounds in Germanic. Now, as you're moving through there, not every language moved off that way. And as they split off in terms of their sounds, this is where we get our different language families. So it's only the Germanic languages that change this way. And so Grimm, this is, of course, Jakob Grimm of the famous Brothers Grimm who collected the fairy tales. He was also an important uh, linguist, and he's the guy who sort of figured out how do we get to our Germanic languages from Indo-European? What are the changes in Indo-European that had to happen? And so I, I want you to follow along with that. Um, there was a complication, which is uh, which was in step three. Step three of Grimm's Law, there seemed to be some exceptions to the rule that, that didn't make sense. And it, he could tell that the rule worked, but there seemed to be some exceptions. And then later on, a guy by the name of Werner came along and he figured out exactly how that one worked. And so Werner's Law is, in fact, step three of Grimm's Law. And it's, uh, uh, it's a complicated uh, sort of set of exceptions. In certain, in certain environments, the language changes this way. In certain other environments, they change other ways. And of course, when we mean environments in this case, we mean sound environments. We don't mean like these people lived in the mountains or it was good weather here. But instead, what we mean uh, is in a stressed syllable or an unstressed syllable, sounds will change in, in one way or another. So as you're learning the backgrounds of English, make sure that you really know that tree uh, and, and you have a sense of how everything fits together in it. And also, I want you to know Grimm's Law and also that Werner's Law is there in the third step of Grimm's Law.